Welcome back, Slam Pigs Union Smack, episode 5, coming right back at you, right here on the Biggie TMD. I am Travis from Slam Pigs Podcast, Slam Pigs Fruits Control, and of course, this Union Smack, follow me on Twitter at the Biggie TMD. Check out the Reset Button Podcast also if you're into gaming. And of course, at my side, it wouldn't be Union Smack without him, guys. Welcome back, the maniac, Matt Tennant. What's going on, man? How was your week? And welcome back. Thank you very much. And it's been a really good week. Well, I'll say really good week. You know, same stuff, different week. But nothing horrendous and for everyone listening you can follow me at tenant future dw on twitter and can i just say a big thank you to everybody who's got back to me this week with praise for last week's episode which was our SummerSlam 92 review people yes. seem to love that and thank you very much for the, the views and the support most definitely thank you guys so much and that that video was one of the most fun i've ever had <laughs> to make like, it I, was i loved it last week and a shout out to some new pallies this week M Sporate, I believe that's how you pronounce it. His channel, go over there and check it out, give him a sub. The Prodigal J, good fella, good guy. Going to have him on Slam Picks in the future. Uh, a couple new pallies I met this week, so good to have you aboard. Nice to meet you guys, and thank you. They love the show, too. Thank you guys for the feedback. Yeah. But, Matt, I'm not even going to say it. There is no fucking UK show again. But again, I made you, to replace that, do a little homework this week. Originally, I was going to have you check out Jack Gallagher and Tony Nese from 2 of 5 this week, but... Yeah. I just couldn't let that main event go by without getting your two cents on it. Neville and Rich Swan from 2 of 5 Live this week. Let's get right into it before we kick off No Mercy 99 this week, guys, so stay tuned. But, Matt, what did you think of this match on 2 of 5 this week? Really enjoyed it. And that is to my surprise because, I mean, ashamedly, I've never watched 2 of 5 Live before, and it's been going, what, nearly a year now? Yeah. I just couldn't. Like I said to you on Twitter, Travis, I just can't find an extra hour after Raw and SmackDown and NXT to sit and watch it. So I'm I'm glad you recommended it to me because I actually really enjoyed it. And I might make the effort to watch next week's. That's an it. That, that's a maybe. That's a maybe. But the match itself, really good main event. And I actually enjoyed this more than Neville and Austin Aries. I did too. Extreme rules. I did, too. I totally agree with that. Uh, before we get to the match real quick, you talk about, you know, there's so much wrestling. Just in WWE during the week, many hours of wrestling. Mm -hmm. I say it all the time. WWE are gluttons. They can't help themselves. Do they realize, do, in your opinion, though, let's be serious, do you think they realize they're burning their audience out with this shit, or do they just don't care? I don't think they care. I think they definitely know, because who doesn't look at, what is it, six hours now? It's going to be seven hours, Travis, when the UK show does come along. Yeah. So who doesn't look at, for arguments, like seven hours of wrestling and say, this is a lot to pack into, say, three days? Yeah. Maybe if they spread it out over the week. You know, I'd, I'd be fine if they moved SmackDown to Fridays again, live. Yeah. And I'd... at least we've got Mondays, Wednesdays, Friday. That'd be fine. As good as that some... would be to see SmackDown, I'm sorry to cut you off, to return to Fridays, right. I think business-wise, that's a lot. Because you remember when it went to Fridays, it took a nosedive. Mm -hmm. Because that's like one of the worst yeah. nights to air wrestling on. Because people are doing things. You know what I'm saying? That's true. But I would prefer that's... it to be that format again. Not Because, like, you're right. Even Raw, SmackDown right after Raw is too much. Like, let us let us process mm -hmm. what happened on Raw first. Yeah. Know? But I yeah, agree. the match. Neville and Rich Swan. Uh, shout out to our friend Broski at First Thing in the Morning. Get over there, subscribe. I was a guest on this podcast the other day. I suggested this match to his listeners on air, and I was like, I know that marquee of that match may deter everyone. It doesn't sound like it's going to set your world on fire. But holy <laughs> shit, I think why this registered with me, they actually let Rich Swan be the Rich Swan from Pro Wrestling, yes. from Evolve. Serious. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And this is the Rich Swan I really wish they'd have allowed out the, uh, out the closet when he was Cruiserweight Champion. Yeah. If, if this Rich Swan had been Cruiserweight Champion in, oh, well, at the end of 2016, I think the Cruiserweight division as a whole might have been in a better place when Neville took over at the Royal Rumble. Because yeah. he could have had really... This calibre match with Tony Nese, 
he could have had it with. I'd have been fine with him and Cedric Alexander. Oh yeah. But they didn't. They just. I hate it when they shackle wrestlers and give them a certain a certain arsenal and say, forget what you want to do. You do it the WWE way. And this is a perfect example of if you let them go out, you give them a decent amount of time, you give them enough creative freedom. Look what can happen. Yeah. You know this. This was probably. I'm, I'm going to go out there and say best match on 205 Live history. <laughs> and this is the first match off 205 Live I've watched of their weekly show. So I'm yeah. sure you and Logan will correct me if I'm wrong, but. I'm sure Logan would. I'm not going to correct you because I can't argue with that. It really was a tremendous match. I can't suggest you guys go out of your way to check that match out from last week enough. Yeah. Obviously, Neville getting the win, but I thought it was fine, you know, because Rich Swan didn't come off as weak. He came off as a fighting, you know, down to the wire type thing. He did. The problem, but... the problem is, I didn't really think about this until you told, you know, we DM'd on yeah. Twitter yesterday. When Neville finally loses the strap, you're really concerned. Like, what do you do with him then? I am. He's He's been this major heel for the cruiserweight division for when did he turn heel was it at roadblock um, in december yeah yeah tlc or roadblock or something like that yeah so like, it's been six months going on seven he's been this major heel for the cruiserweight division and he's been really good on the mic not so much probably but in the ring and his actions he's looked like a star oh yeah Understood. in the cruiserweight division but then what happens to him? You, you take the belt off of him, you give it to Cedric Alexander, most probably. You, I don't see anyone else getting it right now. Yeah. Maybe to Zawa. But what happens to Neville then? I see Even it. if the cruiserweight division yeah. goes on and flourishes, I can't see Neville taking a step backwards because that would, for me, that would be demeaning to his character because he's got too much to give, right. which means. What do you do with him? Do you bump him up to Raw? That didn't work well last time. Was, He's going to get... It was a different Neville gone. last time, though. And I think, you know, I don't... In my, you come at me, guys. Neville right now is the best heel in the entire company. I said yes, it. I would he, agree he's, with that, yeah. he is knocking it out of the park every week from facials to promos to... His mm -hmm. in-ring has always been phenomenal. That's neither here nor there. And yeah, I don't yeah. think it's going unnoticed. And... I really don't think Neville is 205 pounds or less, guys. Look at him. And I don't think <laughs> – now, if he is legitimately, he is. I don't think it's going to take him a lot to maybe bulk up and pass that. I could see him a year from now in an IC title picture as a heel, as in a U.S. title picture. I think this got a lot of eyes on him. He was so under the radar in this company for years. Yeah, Ever yeah. since he was signed, he's been under the radar. And now it's like, well, goddamn, look at this guy. I think they're, they've noticed, and I think this time next year, he's going to be in a much more prominent role. In the company, I would, I would, I would like to say, I, you know. I mean, I'd agree with that. I just, I can't see him making it on Raw amongst the wealth of talent they've got on there. And I know a lot of it isn't actual talent, but there's a sea of faces there, and I fear for Neville that he might get lost in them, especially here's, where WWE's priorities lie. Here's a good one. I know they just announced we're getting a uh, Roderick Strong and Bobby Roode in like two weeks, not in a yeah. takeover for the title. I still see Drew McIntyre being the one to take that off Rude. You could even put Neville in Agreed. NXT. Why not put Neville in NXT? Have him go for the NXT. He's a former NXT champion. He's got the credentials. He could use that in promos. He does, and he, he, he'd fare better back in NXT than he would on Raw. I'm just wondering, because SmackDown have done a, a fair job with Jinder Mahal, I'd like to see Neville replace Jinder Mahal as one of the, or if not the main heel on SmackDown. Right up there with Kevin Owens. But I just can't see it happening. I can't see them taking... Because, it, let's be honest, he's seen as a 205 Live guy now, Neville. I just can't see Vince going, let's take the headline act from a, a show that's not done great in the ratings mm -hmm. and let's push him into the main event of SmackDown. I can't see Vince doing that as much as I want him to. Well, with rumours of possibly Mysterio being in talks um that was oh, kinda... really really i mean not I, i'm not a fan of that because ray mysterio is much as, as much of a um i'm sorry groundbreaking as he was back in the mid 90s he's a shell of what he used to be in ring so i he don't is. think I saw, he could saw... hang with the guys you know he couldn't and he was on a preston city wrestling show over here in i think it was new year's eve might have been new year's day <clears throat> and he was fighting carlito 
Uh, honestly, Travis, it, it I, I wouldn't have known it was the same Rey Mysterio yeah. by his in-ring work. That's the he account so of those people slow that are seeing him in the past years or year or two. Um, I mean, I mean, his, it's, his, his, his injuries, his knee, he's yeah, had what? How many surgeries on his knee? Um, I th- it's got what? It's got to be seven, if not more. I was gonna say like I thought it was like Kevin Nash territory, like fifteen fucking surgeries or something. But I don't. It's, <laughs> it it's might bad. Be, it might be like I might have stopped counting after seven, but. But Carlito and Rey Mysterio now, 10, 11 years ago, that would have been a tremendous match. I would have loved to see that mm-hmm. match. But now, not not anything against Carlito, by the way. Now, not so much. I don't think that Rey Mysterio is that key figure. To, I don't I don't think there is a key figure had to bring in for 205 Live. They've neglected it for so long and treated it like main event. Yeah. It might be too little too late. Anything's possible, though. I can't, I can't think of a, a standout cruiserweight right now that would set that division on fire and make 205 Live be a must-see. Yeah. I mean, to, to go that far, you'd, you'd have to go a long way and get Ibushi. You'd have to go a lot and get Sabre Jr. You know what I mean? You'd have to pack the Cruiserweight division with a lot of guys who didn't come over from the, the Cruiserweight Classic. And, and then, but even then, you'd have to give them a hell of a storyline. Right, and all and due respect to Zack Saber Jr., he is nowhere near a big enough name. You know what I mean? To not to, in America, no. No, um, I mean he's well known for the hardcore wrestling fans, but you know it's not all about that most of the time. But at the end of the day, this is not a cruise control episode. Let's wrap up the cruise away. <laughs> it's a great match, Matt. I'm glad you liked it. Real quick, is Neville your favorite UK performer on the main roster right now? On the main roster, yes. I can't bring to mind anyone else who stands out from the UK on the main roster. Because they've just gone so hokey with Jack Gallagher. You know what I mean? It's yeah, like, they, they, they have, yeah. I, I mean, I, yay, I, it was funny for like a fucking week, and he got the Royal Rumble spot with the umbrella, but man, just, I don't know. They act like it's Perry Saturn with the mop sometimes, I don't know, but... Let's yeah. get down to business, Matt. Why we're here this week, it is time once again, my friend, another retro review... Oh. Where are we going this time in the lovely land of England? We are going back to the Manchester Evening News Arena in Manchester, England on May the 16th, 1999 for No Mercy. Nice American accent. I've never heard you do that. In Park. <laughs> yes, you. the don't, very yeah, first, <laughs> the, the inaugural No Mercy pay-per-view. Now, this took place yeah. right around the time of the higher power storyline in WWF. Yes, right in Ugh. the middle of it. Like that that was drawing to a close not long after I forgot what comes after No Mercy. Um help. Over the edge. <laughs> over the edge. That came did it come before Over the Edge or after? I want to say it came after because unfortunately I don't think Owen was on the show. There was no IC uh, title match, I believe, on this show. I don't that's think. Right. Yeah, I'd... that's right. So Wait. we were, so we must have been coming to the end of the higher power, and I should know this because shameless plug. It's in my Undertaker book coming soon. But yes. like, I, I've had so much information to process. It's been, you know what I mean. You have to get rid of some of it to to put yes. in the next lot. So yeah, we were coming to the end of the higher power storyline, and this show. It was packed. I hope you guys like the corporate fucking ministry (laughs) storyline because this show is stocked full of it from top to bottom. God. And I hope you like Shane McMahon promos because they're endless. My God. I literally, what did I count? Six before his even match? (laughs) I I think I think there were six before his match and two afterwards. Oh, man. And go ahead. Let's get out of our system because I know it's been irking you. Guys, do not make a drinking game out of how many times they say no mercy on the show, or you will have alcohol poisoning, guaranteed. You will. You'll be in irony with a stomach pump and a drip in your arm, and it's the, the amount of time. I mean, we'll, we'll get to it through the rest of the show, but yeah. the amount of times they instruct Jerry Lawler to say he's going to have no mercy on him, he's got no mercy. Oh my God! Just turn off his microphone for ten minutes. It was so annoying. Not it even was him. so it annoying. Was Michael Cole, Shane, JR, everybody that got a possible chance to pick up a That's microphone it. on this show said no mercy. <laughs> At least twice in their life. God. Jesus. But Matt, how, you know, speaking of promos, how did this show kick off? This show kicked off. Brace yourself, everyone. This show kicked off with a corporate ministry slash 
Shane McMahon promo. They all came to the ring. Triple H in his one shirt, as we were talking about beforehand. <laughs> there were massive chants of our soul through the crowd when Shane picked up the microphone, which was good. At least he had heat. Yeah. At least he wasn't one of these, you know, leaders who people go, don't care. You know, I'll give him that. Shane had heat back then. It's a basic mission statement, Travis, at that. He he runs down the, the matches that the corporate ministry members have got. I mean, he, he does actually mess up a line by, I think he forgot that you couldn't win the main event by count out. It was a no disqualification match. And I think I think he, he said something like, you, you can win by count out or something, and you couldn't. Well, for for and, those of you guys that didn't watch in this time, uh, let's speed everybody up. The Undertaker was a heel at this time was because Austin mm-hmm. was so red hot. He dwarfed The Undertaker in popularity by this time. So yeah. they turned him heel. They gave The Undertaker his first ever stable, which in the beginning I actually liked a lot. The, 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 the first <laughs> incarnation of the ministry, it wasn't bad. It I didn't was think. okay. Like, I, I liked it for a fortnight and then it was crap. I just don't think it was The Undertaker. As much as they tried to repackage him as this ritual carrying out person. Ritual carrying out, that's not even a word. Satanic. This, this person, Go ahead satanic, and say it. thank you, thank you. This satanic person who'd drown his opponents in blood and rechristen them. This, that wasn't The Undertaker. You Which know what I mean? We'd had nine years of The Undertaker doing one act before this. And I, I don't know anyone who looks at that Undertaker. And I'm sure there's some people I've never met who love it. I, I know one person on Twitter said it's their Undertaker. That's fine. But for me, this wasn't the Undertaker. This was a desperate attempt to get him back into the spotlight. Relevancy, you know. Yeah. In your opinion, you know, another cheap plug to your Taker book coming out. Is this the <laughs> worst time in the Undertaker's career? Or would he oh, see worse? No, no, by far. Because I'm thinking at the time he wrestled King Mabel. <laughs> He said, and I had to do a lot of research into like his opinion on stuff and that. And Mark Calloway, a few years later, came out and said the corporate ministry slash ministry of darkness was the worst time in his career creatively because it offered him nothing. And I, I can see that. Like it, it started out about the Undertaker. And very quickly graduated back towards Vince McMahon and Stone Cold Steve Austin. And you know what? Shout out to uh, Brian Zane from Wrestling With Regret. On his, uh, he does a lot of top eight lists, and he put uh, one video was the eight worst Vince McMahon storylines. And at number one, he put Austin yeah. versus McMahon. And now, before the people came at him with pitchforks, I already knew where he was going with that. If they would have just ended McMahon and Austin at WrestleMania 15, would have been perfect. Yeah. No. But what we got from this is 20 plus years of authority fucking angles that are always boring. They're never going to live up. <laughs> Vince always had to throw himself in these storylines and fuck yep. them up every Agreed. single time. You know? Agreed. And he, he even went as far as to, I mean, at, in 99, to my recollection, The Undertaker was the longest serving wrestler, at least full time wrestler on his roster. He even went as far as to put himself above. You know what? The man who'd served under him and done his company a fucking lot of good in the process. Just push him aside and step into the spotlight yourself, Vince. That's not how business is done. Mm-hmm. And for me, can I just say the best part of this promo? Shane was proficient on the mic, but the best part of this promo was a sign in the crowd. It might have been when they cut back to Jerry Lawler and Jim Ross, which said, I wish I was a lesbian. <laughs> I, I just, I, I don't know why that just amused me more than Shane McMahon talking. <laughs> I, my favorite part of this uh, opening promo was how fucking strong he made Midian look. He made him seem like a main eventer the way he built him up. Yeah, I, I, I'd agree with that. <laughs> the all seeing, all knowing, he's going to defeat Kane. Fucking, ugh. it was, it was, it was terrible. I, I've never, I know we'll get onto Midian later. Yeah, but. We will definitely get more corporate ministry in later, probably after the next match. Uh, but let's, what did the show kick yep. off with once again? The curse <sighs> of fucking Tiger Ali Singh! <laughs> again! Hopefully this is the last again. we ever have to review a Tiger Ali Singh match. Matt, it was Tiger Ali Singh, possibly the sweatiest I've ever seen a wrestler <laughs> in my life for no reason, just standing there. Yeah. Um, go ahead, Matt, what, what kicked off with this? 
we kicked off with Tiger Ali Singh versus Gilberg. And if you're looking for a long technical match, possibly not for you. His entrance lasted longer than the match did. And his promo before the bell rang lasted longer than this match did. And I was really embarrassed for Gilberg. Like, not, not just watching this. Throughout the whole thing, when I was watching it as a child slash teenager, I was always really embarrassed for Gilberg. Just the, the faces they made him pull. And I know the gimmick was meant to mock Goldberg. But oh, and of course, it was just Goldberg yeah. didn't take kindly to that shit at all. When he came in years later, he stiffed the hell out of Goldberg <laughs> in that segment with The Rock. If you remember, yeah, I remember. You that. know what? I think Dwayne Hill. He was such an enhancement talent for years. He was just happy to be there in some form of yeah. spotlight. Um, if anything, I felt worse for Tiger Ali Singh in his career, <laughs> not just this match. I mean, you talk about a guy that just Jesus Christ. What do you, let, since this is the last we're ever going to talk, by the way, Tiger Ali Singh won in like a minute, guys, if you care. Would Tiger Ali Singh worked in WCW? I think he might have worked in WCW. You think he should have think... just jumped ship after this? Because didn't he just go back over to Japan or he retired shortly after? I don't think he retired. I read he still competes now and again to this day. <laughs> oh, but none of them really retire. How silly of me. Yeah, what a spectacle that must be. Tiger Alley Singh in 2017, Travis. Just run that through your mind a second. I'm sure Impact would swoop them up in a second if they could. I bet they would. Oh. But yes, the answer to your question is yes. I could see him completely working in WCW with Vince Russo. <sighs> Fucking Vince Russo. I think Can you imagine if he's had... gotten somewhat over, because he wasn't... We say it all the time. When we say over, that doesn't mean like a crowd pop. That means any reaction. No. He was getting yeah. the heel heat, but it was cheap heel heat. Like anybody could have got that with the gimmick yeah. he gave him. You know? I can totally see Ty Riley Singh going to WCW after this and capturing, I'd, I'd say capturing the WCW title in 2000, late 2000. Why not? Everybody um, else did in 2000. <laughs> that's it. There was like 27 title changes in six months. Like, if it had been there, it had been fair game for one. You know what I would have done with um, Tiger if I was him? I would have made a little trip down to the place where everyone was known that they would reinvent you and, you know, a career booster. ECW, I think that could – Paul Heyman could have mm. brought out – the Paul Heyman brought out the best in everybody. He was a mad scientist like everybody says. But I think it would have benefited him the most for tweak that character, you know, yeah. still make it like the, I, the cheap heat Indian heel but a little more sped up to times, you know. I, I never gave that any thought. But now you mention it, yeah. Why not? I mean, I've seen Paul. I've seen Paul Goldberg. Then stop looking at your notes, Matt. Paul Heyman. I've seen him work miracles with with characters like Tommy Dreamer, who didn't, who shouldn't have ever worked. Yeah. With the crowd, but he, he made them stars. So maybe Ty Growley Singh could have been this ultra heel in ECW. But he I was. think by '99, the wrestling world was. He'd been tarnished with the same brush. That a lot of heels get tarnished with, and that's you're there for a cheap pop and nothing more. I think he's, if, if any, I don't know what his contractual obligations are, obviously, but in '97, when like his babyface run initially flopped, that would have been the key time to head down to ECW because those were the prime years in ECW, late '97. Um, yeah, you know what I mean, it I think just... one of his contractual obligations weren't to put on a fucking good match because <laughs> it'd have been fired if there was. Yeah, oh my god, or promos, but um. Hopefully, we have done it. We have passed the bar. No more Tiger Ali Singh on Slam Pigs, Matt. That's it, yes. Let's make a pact now. Not one more Tiger <laughs> Ali Singh match gets mentioned on this show. I should not have ever. to go out of my way to think about how to rejuvenate Tiger's career. That's how much time I had to think about Tiger <laughs> Ali Singh this week. I bet it was more interesting than this match. And if anyone cares, like Travis said, he won in a minute with a neck breaker. That, that, that was the extent of it. And Gilberg was light heavyweight champion. Yep. Make of that what you will. To drop it to S.A. Rios later. But that, that could be a future episode in the future. But let me take a shot in the dark. I'm guessing, believe it or not, we had a corporate ministry promo next. Not promo, match. Oh, I thought they were, like, didn't Shane come out right before the match and cut another little promo? Or I'm just mixing up. No, he story. came out after it. Okay, okay. But yes, so finally, next... we had the ministry in action. Six-man tag. Now, storyline-wise... I even forgot that Gangrel, Edge, and Christian were in the ministry for like a month. <laughs> they were. Yeah. And they, they I thought, were. you know, looking back, they added something to it, which was, it was okay. It was, could have been worse. 
they actually uh-huh. were then ostracized, kicked out. They showed highlights mm-hmm. from Raw on the show of when them getting kicked out. What did you think of this build up? I mean, the build up to it was okay. I mean, the brood did add something to the ministry, but I always got the feeling they were there to to create a storyline branch yeah. later on. You know, Which they were never going to fit. Yeah, it, I mean, it, it's all right. And them as opposition to the ministry, or at least a part of the ministry, worked somewhat. Um, I don't know. I think it was a, it, it was a weak storyline that took them out of the ministry, with Christian telling Ken Shamrock where the Undertaker had hidden Stephanie McMahon. It, it was weak. It was a case but, of, in their eyes, uh, beat you down to build you back up, like get sympathy yeah. for the brood. But the thing is, Gangrel isn't the easiest motherfucker to have sympathy for because he just <laughs> screams heel when you look at him. Yeah, he yeah. does. He does, but thankfully there wasn't that much Gangrel in this match. Oh, thankfully. Thankfully. And can I just point out something to everyone listening? I know I DM'd you this, this week. When the Ministry, which is the Acolytes of Viscera, in this match, came to the ring. The announcer, for some reason, announced them to be a combined weight of one thousand five hundred pounds. Yeah. And then Jim Ross added that Viscera weighs five hundred pounds, <laughs> which means somehow Farouk and Bradshaw weigh a thousand pound between them. <laughs> Travis, yeah. work that out. I I'm not doing mathematics with WWE in 1999, <laughs> um, but yeah, the actual members of the ministry were Viscera and the APA, Farouk and Bradshaw yeah. before the APA. They they actually just got christened with the Acolytes gimmick at this time, brand new for them. In your opinion, the best match of the show? I can't really argue with that. It was a it was a good six man tag match. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, uh, the ministry getting the win. So of that, and I mean, it was a UK show. Your their main audience, of course, with their television was the u.s but could you give the brood a little bit of their fucking heat back at least like they got nothing in i feel like like i don't know yeah i, th- I think um for the majority of this and even let me look at my notes even like there's a ministry match later on oh yeah there sure is um yeah the ministry will build up in this like, throughout the entirety of the pay-per-view to fall at the end, like everyone who lost, I don't want to give anyone spoilers, so I won't name names, but like everyone who lost to the ministry on this card sort of got their heat back at the end of the show. I would say Kane did way more than the brood. Yeah, I thought like, having, I mean, we'll get to it later, but having the brood there at the end sort was sort of. Right, but okay. at the end of the day, I mean, was... at the end of the day, they lost their match and they didn't. Like, they did. I don't know. It's what I'm not going to analyze the fucking brood's push at 99. <laughs> let's <laughs> let's move the train along, Matt. Did this uh, segue right into Blackman and Draws, or did we get a Shane promo in between? Shane After the match, out. you said. I'm sorry. I will, apologies. I'm not with it today, Matt. That's that's fine. Um, Edge and Christian. Can I just say, were the best thing about this match before we move on? Oh, most definitely. Like, that they held this match together really well and Christ. took a hell of a beating. Not even close. <laughs> <laughs> and then. Um, JBL, JBL, Bradshaw, sorry, won with a clothesline from hell, which was fine. Yeah. I mean, the ministry had to look strong, I suppose. Pretty sure um, shortly after this in the ministry, uh, I'm sorry, the Acolytes won the tag belts from like the Hardys. Yes, like, they did, yeah. yeah. Which was rough on everyone. It, it, was, <laughs> it was very rough. But yeah, the promo after, was just more typical Shane talk pretty much. It was, it, it was another mission statement, one down. However many more to go. And that that that's basically, that was basically his role after every ministry match to say two down, three down, so many more to go. That that was it. And then we came to actually before the Blackman match, Travis, we came to a Steve Blackman vignette. We d- you know what? Didn't hate it. I thought anyone who didn't hadn't seen Steve Blackman before, if you'd have watched this vignette before you watch this match you would have thought like he was the biggest badass in the world you would have thought he was going up against austin for the title at wrestlemania you, you would have they did that good a job of pushing him and this could be the first time we match. i agree this could be the first time they dropped that new theme music has on because in his entrance he still came out to that shitty bad blood 97 theme that generic he did. i noticed that I, I was sitting there scratching my head thinking i'm sure he had the 
You know what I mean? Like the boom, boom, the, the sticks yeah. beating at the beginning. I thought he for sure had now. Fly, man. I Maybe hated I just... that fucking theme, by the way. That that shitty stock metal theme they gave him was so bad. So That's boring. A... Boom, 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 boom. Dan, 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 dan. It's just, <laughs> you know who had really good underrated music for this time was fucking Dan Severn. I loved his music, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, Matt, possibly a match worse than Tiger Ali singing and Gilbert. Uh, Steve Blackman and Draws. Steve Blackman made his way out to his yeah. shitty old music. And the cat in the hat, Dr. Seuss, Zany Draws. I'm not going to make fun of him too much, guys, because obviously, you know, paralysis isn't funny. But they they finally, this was right after LOD 2000 split, and they're like, well, fuck yeah. it, give him a cat in the hat hat. <laughs> it was like Jameer Acquire or something. But what did you think of uh, Piercer Draws? I thought this Draws was better than LOD 2000 Draws. That just felt like he was trying to muscle his way into a part of history where he didn't belong. The character was the shit, but what else are we going to do with him yeah. after that? You basically killed the character after LOD 2000, and that was four months that ended before this at yeah. Capital Carnage. So in four months, like I think he did well to get a new character over at all. I can't ever remember a time when Draws was in the company where he elicited any kind of response. It was always kind of people sitting on their hands. Even when he pushed Hawk off the Titan Tron, it's not like yeah. people were like, because everyone knew, like, they're not going to kill anybody. It's fucking wrestling. <laughs> um, do you that remember, is this is a throwback too to you and the listeners. Do you remember the Wrestle, first one they ever did, and only one, the WrestleMania Rage Party, the night before WrestleMania this year? Oh, God. That, it was... <laughs> that rings a bell. That, it, it was just, yeah. it was before the Hall of Fame like they do now. Then it was an experiment and failed. It was promoted as this mingle with the wrestlers show live on USA Network. They had like a couple bands perform. By the way, none of the wrestlers were mingling. They were up on risers, <laughs> but like a couple guys would be in the crowd, and one of those guys was Draws. And I remember watching this back, and it's like some of the people literally didn't even know he was a wrestler for the company. Scene like he was just like at a concert. Man, there was like four thousand people there. They never did a good job at promoting draws after LOD 2000. Like, they brought Albert in. I'm, I'm sure there was a vignette here or there, but he was just, like, cannon fodder. And not everybody can be yeah. champion. We say it all the time. And I think it was the right fit for him because he had no charisma. Let's be real. He didn't. He, he had nothing. Um, I mean, he wasn't helped. And I've been waiting to mention this a quite a while, Travis, and like, until it came up. Did you see Beyond the Mat, the documentary film? Oh, yeah. I sure did. Yeah. That part in it where can can I finally do that impression? I've been waiting. <laughs> please, please. He's gonna, go he's ahead. gonna puke. Thank you. <laughs> that is the one where Vincent Miles sat him down in his office. This poor fucker, right? Who'd had all the aspirations in the world. I love it he's when you dre- say fuck. It's the best. Yeah. <laughs> he he dreamt of obviously like sat in his bedroom as a teenager, dreaming of main event in WrestleMania. He's sitting in the corporate off in the corporate. Um, Vince's office. reception of Titan Towers he's thinking I'm going to go in there and Vince is going to look at me and he's going to go you've got the look let's see how you try out in the ring and do you know what if you've got it in the ring we're going to push you as Austin's next big opponent and he gets into that room for anyone who's not seen it and I'm going to say it again this poor fucker gets a, a bin thrown across the table at him and Vince McMahon says to him be sick into that do you, remember Jim, do you remember Jim Ross going, you need a little coffee or something? Yeah. <laughs> he just takes a, a little sip of coffee and goes, <clears throat> Matt, I, the last thing I ever want to do is shoot down your hopes and dreams, but it came out later on. Uh, Barry Blostein, the director of that film, um, and, and Vince and Jim Ross and later said that would have never, Vince wouldn't have done that unless it was, because it was being filmed. It was sensationalized. Vince probably wouldn't have made him do that. It was for the sake yeah. of the film. But still, I don't think Draws was either like this. I think I just think Draws was he was in the NFL, correct? Because you know, God mm-hmm. knows, Jim Ross had to say it three times on this match. <laughs> oh, you got my Monday Night Raw puking. I've never seen that clip, Jim Ross. So you making it up? But yeah, he was a former football player, transition wrestling. So I don't know if it, I mean it could have been his lifelong dream, you know. But yeah, it was it was, it was a good fit for the like uh, he does not scream even I C title type. No, he he screams curtain jerker. Or dark match filler that that, that was Drozzy's career, and of course I have sympathy. What happened to him? Right. But for me, you know, a, bo- a botch is a botch in any on any show. Could happen. Anywhere. Injuries, 
in, yeah, injuries can happen to anybody, but that that that's second worst of it. You know, the worst of it happened to Owen Hart. The second worst of it happened to Draws. You know, and of course, it, it D, D- Lo's career never recovered from that. I don't know if no, he was being punished. No. The only reason I think maybe he was being punished because I, you know, this is a shot in the dark too. You remember this? SummerSlam '98. It kicked off with Val Venus and D'Lo Brown. I remember mm-hmm. a power bomb botch in that match where D'Lo literally dropped Val on his fucking head. I remember that as well. Now was it? A, I, can't, I can't. Do you remember D'Lo's awesome? Uh, it was his running power bomb spot. I love that spot. But he went for that. I don't know if it was like perspiration, but Val slipped and right on his fucking head. Oh, and wow. was that the same? move that cripple draws or was it a pile driver i always thought it was a botched uh he went for that running power bomb again it could be a pile driver though i could be wrong see i thought it was a pile driver because i was gonna say who the fuck taught him to do that move billy gun yeah really <laughs> yeah from the last episode or two episodes ago i should say i don't ever remember d doing a pile driver ever so maybe he so, did yeah. maybe he shouldn't do it again if it was obviously but <laughs> Let's, I mean, we spent way um, too much time on this match, Matt. We, we have. Yeah. Who got the win? What was the result? The win was Steve Blackman and reverse triangle choke, I think. And the, the main thing I had wrong with this, how many years experience of Jim Ross and Jerry Lawler got between them? Like, it must be over 50 years between them by this point. Yeah. And not one of them knew what the fucking move was called. Yeah. Not one of them. Sitting there going... Oh, he, he, choke! Um, you you can hear them running it through in their head. Like choke? Is it a choke? Is it some sort of submission? If it, Fuck it! We, we, we'll just go with a. He won it with a chokehold, ladies and gentlemen. If if it wasn't large fake implants or a former football background, they were lost. <laughs> Let's be real. Yeah. Jim Ross was a great announcer, but nowhere near like a Joey Styles with knowing the moves and stuff like the names. Oh no, no. Not 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 Jim Ross's big forte. His was more of the emotion and the voice sound bites and stuff. But you're totally right. They should, especially Lawler. Lawler should definitely be on that shit. Um, this is knowing the moves as a former wrestler. But let's move the train along. Did this segue into Kane and Midian? No, this segued into Beaver Cleavage. Oh Jesus Christ! I forgot Jesus about this. Fucking Christ! Do Most it. of the headbangers give it to put him. Put in put in a silly boy's school outfit. With this fucking oversized Jewish cap on his head, tasting cereal in a, a weird, it was, uh, like it was a really weird fucking sixties black and white comedy vignette. It was from. It was based off Leave It to Beaver, the old TV See, show from. The I 50s don't. I don't ever remember that. Maybe we didn't get that over here. I mean, I'm not 86 years old, so I don't remember watching <laughs> it because it's from like the yeah. 50s. But I do remember this. It's like a staple over here of classic, like I Love Lucy, Leave It to Beaver, stuff like that. But yeah, it was, it was totally and based. Then, on, and then you talk about fucking angles. If ever in wrestling, scream Vincent Kennedy McMahon. Look no further. <laughs> Holy shit! Everything about oh, this God. was. From the incest to the, you're referencing, in 1999, Leave it to Beaver was already like a 40 or 30 year old show, so what the fuck relevancy is that then? Exactly. It was like, we've got Mosh of the Headbang, <coughs> what, what, we want to keep him around, because he's alright in the ring I suppose, what do we do with him? Hmm, let's make him a little incestual 30 year old schoolboy. Who wants to drink milk from his mother's tits? Where did let, like let, like let's 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 slow down for a second. Let's take this in seriously because it's so easy to mock this gimmick. Seriously, Matt, where did they expect to go with this fucking gimmick? For real, I have no idea. Like, how did they expect this to get over a former tag team champion? Or were they even bothered about like where his career would go from here? Or was it just we need a comedy character? He's knocking about in the back. He's got nothing to do. Thrasher's gone some fucking way, so we'll put him in it. It was, it nearly made me throw up in my mouth, and that that's a that's a term I've used a lot on Twitter for really bad angles I've seen. But this this was the pits. Yeah, this could very well take the cake. This has to be in my top five worst gimmicks of all time. Has to be. Yeah, no question. I would rather watch the Shockmaster in a construction gear than this vignette again. <laughs> Come at me. <laughs> Um, I would rather watch Virgil versus Nails. Man. Again. And Travis, I'll leave it to you to complete your little task I gave you for every Union Smack show. <laughs> well, see, now I can't do it because it's not special. <laughs> he fucking... <laughs> That's true. We'll, we'll, we'll edit that bit out. 
I'm no, I'm, that. Like, I'm not editing that out. <laughs> I'm sure there's more in this show when you know what's coming. But uh, let's yeah. please let's move along from Beaver Cleavage. And, uh, you know, well, let's not move along. Later, he would transition to just himself, and his, that was his real-life girlfriend. But they got to make him a woman beater. They couldn't just make him Chaz. <laughs> Put him in boxer <laughs> shorts with a smiley face on his penis and let him hit women. Oh, God. No wonder his career bombed after this. But <sighs> Chaz, still, woman beater Chaz, better gimmick than this. Kane yep. versus Midian. This may be uh, Phineas Godwin mm-mm, slash mm-mm. Midian's highest profile match I ever remember. Hang on. We've missed two things out, Travis. Oh, We've missed me. out Mankind promo. Ah. Uh, God. I mean, there's not much to talk about. He, it's a basic Mick Foley glorified pop where he mentions Manchester about a million fucking times. And then the Bulldog, who, who another botch, by the way, says... I was talking to Davy Boy Smith today. Who's from Manchester? No nope. fucking don't. They, don't they, they did it again. The history. They did it did again. It again. Did it again. <sighs> but cheap pops make for only specialty. And that's like that's <laughs> like they're fuck, That's <laughs> like they're no. Let's say they're over here, right? And that's like me going on and be like, I talked to Steve Austin today. You know, Nebraska's <laughs> own. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jesus Christ. You're, you're right. You're 100 percent right. And then he he says like one of the weirdest things I've heard on all the show, apart from that Beaver Cleavage shit. He says I'm not supposed to say wanker. In the like, why? Area. Yeah. Why not? One, you, you've got the word ass on television every week. Two, four months earlier, you got Jacqueline's Jubblies out on television live. So, what's yeah. the difference between saying wanker and getting a woman to get her kit off? Lest not we forget, like, years later at the Raw Divas search when they gave the Divas a live mic, do you remember? And they called them, like, cock-sucking gutter sluts. And they oh, didn't God. edit it out. Yeah. But don't say wanker. We'll don't say, say, we'll say wanker but... all day on the wanker, 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 see? But, uh, you know, at wanker. least at least from all the UK show promos we got from Mick Foley, there was no terrible British impersonation. It was probably the best one, not saying it was great, but better than what we've got from it. <laughs> yeah, it's not saying much to say it was the best one. It drifted from subject to subject and didn't really have a, didn't really have an end goal apart from to right. get mankind over. But yeah, you know, this kind of screams and... like finally, like Jesus Christ, get a name out there, throw the fans a bone because what they've sat through so far. That's it. We're, we're, once again, Tiger Ali sing at the beginning of the show just fucking smashed us in his promo. So why not go go out there and pretend we love them all? I mean, That'll you got you got to think. Looking back on what we've covered so far, this is legit the only like, I don't even want to say a bigger name. Actual babyface came out that the fans could give a shit about because you had Steve Blackman and the Brood literally <laughs> just turned, so the fans were kind of yeah. coming, but it was too soon to give them a full babyface reaction. Mick Foley was literally the first bone they were throwing, and we are what, 30, 40 minutes into the show. Yeah, least. yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, yeah. Next up, before. Before we get on to Kane and Midian, we had an, an, another like annoying backstage fan fest interview sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. If you That's... basically think, basically everyone who hasn't seen it thinks SummerSlam '92 beginning, but inside the arena, and a lot of these fans, when they were questioned who was going to win the main event, do they not know wrestling? Like, I lost count of how many of them said Triple H. Do you really think one they're going to change the WWF Championship in Britain? On a a throwaway pay per view event, and to, do you really think they give it to Triple H yet, while Austin and the Undertaker were still around? I still say like, when they when they did a lot of these, they would coach the fans, especially in this era, because let's be honest, every fan would have said Austin. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But if they'd have said to me, if they'd have put a camera in front of me and said, "Can you just say you want Triple H to win the main event?" No. No. Like. Fuck no. off. <laughs> I said, fuck you, mister. <laughs> we have not yet shouted out Triple H's t-shirt in this. Uh, this was right <laughs> right after he turned heel from DX and they didn't have a shirt ready, so they just threw a fucking No Mercy pay-per-view shirt on him. Yeah, best one of the best biased opinion here, but one of the best pay-per-view t-shirts there's ever been. It kind of got that feel like, you remember like guys back then, they, they never had their own shirt. Like Steve Blackman would just wear like a WWF <laughs> Attitude shirt. And that had to yeah. suck for them. That had to be embarrassing. You know what I mean? It kind of felt like it that. did. But uh, <laughs> I, I just said the millions of millions of dollars that came after for Triple H sort of softened that blow. I'm sure he's okay now. He's do he did all right for himself. I'm guessing. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure he sleeps at night perfectly well now. I wonder if he has that shirt framed. <laughs> I bet he does somewhere in his little gym in his 
fifty million dollar mansion somewhere. Yeah, this was the first day of the rest of my life. <laughs> Finally, <laughs> let's get to Kane. <laughs> Kane against Midian. Um, anybody uh, that thought Midian had a chance in this, you've obviously this was the first wrestling show you've ever watched because why would Midian? Yeah. The perfect, the perfect cannon fodder guy was Midian in this time. Let's be real. Yeah. Um, I mean, Midian, not Midian, sorry. Kane versus a former Godwin. Like, would you ever have looked at that and said, pay-per-view quality, everyone? Uh, you know what, though? Not a terrible, way better than I thought it would be. Not saying it was great, but passable, I guess, for a bigger man match. Not not the total yeah. shits, a little shitty, but not the total shits. We've seen worse, I think. Let's be honest, Travis, this had disaster written all over it. It did, I think that's why I was pleasant. You know, obviously that speaks more to Glenn Jacobs as a performer. Like, he totally carried this match, in my opinion. When Kane carries you, yeah. I don't know what that says. <laughs> <laughs> that says something about your ability, doesn't it? When, when Kane has to carry you through a match. But you know what, I'd but... rather go back and watch this match again than see Blackman and Draws. I'd agree with that. And I'd, I, I will say about Midian real name Dennis Knight, that if anyone, anyone's thinking of looking at a period of his career, I don't know why you would, but if anyone wants to go back and look at a period of his career, Godwin's first, for me by far, then Midian, just, just skip naked Midian altogether, because I've, I've never sat at home and think, I fancy watching some wrestling, what can I put on? What do I really want? I know, I want to watch a former member of the Godwins, Nate. who were a, a base, a basic, backward hillbilly tag team run around with his kit off no sorry like skip that anyone all together pretend how many, naked how many midian... different drug cocktails prescription pills do you think was in that fanny pack naked midian more at the time <laughs> we all know he's not balanced. enough if that, not midian, enough you're right enough. <laughs> <laughs> but matt what played out in the match and uh, what did you think um crap skip this <laughs> or go to the toilet like if you're watching this on some backwards device where you can't f- fast forward it nip, pop out for four minutes to the toilet it was it was terrible but travis can i say like <coughs> the end of this was even worse than the match i agree um the ending sucks. kane kane gets the win by disqualification corporate ministry invade the ring and then weirdly now bear in mind you've got farouk ron simmons isn't the smallest guy in the world You've got Bradshaw, who, again, is built quite well. You've got Midian, who's got some weight behind him. You've got Viscera, who's 500 pounds. Can I can I do it? Can I say where you're going? Because I know where you're going. Go. Then you bring out the one, two, three kid with a fucking <laughs> stick, and he's supposed to be yes. Superman, and they all run away like pussies. Yes, exactly. Jesus Christ. And that, that was just... That took the piss for me. Like, you, you've got this shitty squash match where... <laughs> They acted Kane's like he came legs. out with a fucking Uzi or an assault rifle. He had a kendo stick. <laughs> yeah. Just take it from his hand. There's like eight of you. Uh, do you I'm think, really like, pissed off this week. Viscera couldn't have stood in front of him and like with one blow just knocked him across the ring. <laughs> and he, he runs like a fucking... I don't know. He, he runs like an elephant from a, from a mouse. Oh, God. I think Viscera's breath could have knocked out X-Pac. <laughs> like, for real. It was... <laughs> Oh my god! But the, yeah, dude, this made. No, I'm so glad you segued into this because I forgot about it. This, this made no fucking sense. Uh, it just—it's not like he came out with like Road Dog or backup. It was just little X Pac and a stick. Yeah. I mean, if if it if it had come out with Mankind and the Brood behind him with packed with steel chairs and I could have possibly understood it. Right. But it, one fucking small bloke who I'd probably weigh more than comes out with a stick and. The 500-pound monster is gone. Like, you can't fucking see him for the dust coming off of his heels. Here's another head-scratcher about this little segment. I'm not saying it was one of the shittiest stables they ever did, but the Union was a stable this time. It was Mankind, Test, Big Show, and Shamrock, correct? And you yeah. know what? Yeah. Say what you want about it, but there were a lot of Union signs in the crowd for the show. Why not just bring the fucking Union out with them? They're not doing yeah, anything. Exactly. But what, and was Ken Shamrock on this show? Like, was, did I miss him at some point? He because was I not. didn't see him. He was not. I don't remember even seeing the Big Show on this show. So, you, you've got the big. Let's let's for argument's sake say, at this point in WWF, <clears throat> the biggest babyface faction of the time, and you don't bring two of its fucking biggest stars out. Like one to combat the threat of Midian, uh, not Midian. I thought, sorry, one to combat the threat of Viscera, which Big Show could have done, 
and the other who is he could have took out two men on his own with his skills. I mean, I'm not saying Ken Shamrock had great skills, but he had enough UFC about him to yeah. <clears throat> to take out Midian and at least Shane. He had more skills and than one, two, three kid with a stick. He did. He did. Like I'd have ran if I'd have seen Ken Shamrock come in. Oh, you know what I mean? I that, don't know if you caught this better. when um <clears throat> I thought this was great when X Pac was chasing the heels off. For some reason, I kept looking at Farouk's face. He was smirking. Like, he was like, man, I'll bet this motherfucker would whoop my ass. I'll just do my job. Like, it totally came off. I don't know if you caught that. It was awesome. I did not catch that, but I'm glad you brought it up. But that was that. You know what? I didn't hate X-Pac. You know, I, I'm not a fan, and I know you're not either when they just throw guys together. But this was no. one of those throwing together tag teams that was probably one of my favorites of all time. I didn't hate this team at all. Do you know what? I think we said, I did. was it our Capital Carnage review, that... This was some of Kane's best stuff with X Pac. Like his early, his early <clears throat> 2099. This was some of Kane's best stuff. He'd just come off of a blur feud with The Undertaker. Yeah. And I mean, I lost count, to be honest, of the amount of times he went from heel to face, heel to face. They couldn't decide what to do with him. I don't know who has the bigger record between him and Big Show for turns. I, I will say, as far as the X Pac thing. This was a great time, like that tag team, whatever. This may have been that period, this the whole year 1999, where it it made fans stop looking at Kane as a serious threat. Because look, Kane yeah. was booked as this moron. His best friend X Pac turned on him by the end of this year. His girlfriend Tori left him. It just made Kane look like a fucking schmuck. Kane didn't get his heat back till like 2000 the next year when Paul Bear came back and he tombstone yeah. Tori. So okay. if anything, I could say 1999 didn't really do a lot of good things for Kane. Did a lot of good for X Pac and Tori. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> it did. And I'd, I'd go as far as to say Kane didn't get anything back in the way of stature until King of the Ring 2000, exactly. when he was included in that main event. And then he turned again on The Undertaker before SummerSlam. So for me, really, if, if you were to take out that little bit around King of the Ring 2000, I don't think Kane really made a huge impact on the industry until his feud with Jericho at the end of 2000. I mean, I, I, obviously, I prefer Kane, the very beginning of Kane, his initial feud with Taker. That's the best Kane, in my opinion. You could totally disagree, but I think that's when, Jesus Christ, I can't remember a guy who was booked more impervious than that Kane. Like, he no, would just no sell nothing, and he came off like this fucking monster, and I was a little bit scared of him as a kid. But And yeah. then they made him, they, they sold him out. They sold the character out, basically, because they had nothing else to do with him. Yeah, because let's be real. I don't think that that character, booking-wise, I don't think they had anything for him past that feud with Taker. I think it was going to be a one-off. But they were just like, you know, yeah. maybe they maybe they felt bad for Glenn Jacobs because he was such a company man and would just turn shit into whatever. He would try to See, make Isaac I, Yankum work, and they noticed that. <laughs> I'm of the belief that they kept him around because of his friendship with Mark Calloway. True that. I mean, you could say that for the whole ministry. Because the ministry, at the end of the day, was base, basically the BSK, his boys, his yep. backstage, you know. The Burr Street crew, yep. Yep. You know, vis Viscera. Bradshaw. Every one of those fucking guys, except for the Brood, were in the fucking BSK. They were. Oh. Yeah, they were. And that um, that relationship between Callaway and Bradshaw, it's got nothing to do with this, this quickly, I right. believe was one of the overriding factors in JBL's WWE Championship I totally run. agree with that. I totally agree. And plus, you know, his time on Wall Street doesn't go and notice of Vincent Man Vince and <laughs> shit like that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But uh, let's move the train along. Hopefully, well, I just saw my list. It's not getting any better on their next match. But what went down next, Matt? <laughs> next was actually highlights of Sable versus Deborah from Raw, which was trash. And then we had Nicole Bass versus <sighs> Tory. And if you've never heard of Nicole Bass, just just join the ninety five percent of the rest of the wrestling world. <laughs> like if you if you didn't watch wrestling around this time, you, you'll have never know she existed. I literally, like I was saying earlier, I just I was a guest on Broski's podcast, K fifty the other day. We we're talking about the yeah. women's division today, and every time like they just had the first women's Money in the Bank, and every time there's a milestone for these women. You all, it's always followed up by somebody saying next stop main event at WrestleMania. And I always shoot that down because not that mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't want to see, I'd be all about that. Deborah and Sable was your women's <laughs> division. It's shit like this <laughs> that stagnated this division for years. This is why a women's match at WrestleMania isn't going to draw money. They haven't taken their women seriously in 20 fucking years until the past two years. It's too little too late. It's going to take time okay. right there. You know, I agree, but I, agree. I don't think I don't think the women's title ever got lower than Deborah holding it. Maybe Santino, but I don't 
Just you, you think? Deborah I mean, was the ultimate low point in my opinion because she had no wrestling skills, none less than Sable, less than <laughs> Sable. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can say that. I, I'd throw women in there like Kelly Kelly as well, but at least they had a tiny bit of wrestling training. Right. Um, anyway, Matt. But yeah. There's nothing to this. A 27 second match. It was more of the, the Sable promo beforehand. Go ahead. I didn't. Oh, Sable on a mic. Go for it, Matt. <laughs> well, I've, I've noted it down here that uh, no emotion on her face. Couldn't be less bothered whether she's there or not. And then she, she comes out with a line that sounds like she's out of Downton Abbey, if, if people have seen that. She says, there will be a match taking place this night. What? Like, that really bothered me for some reason. You know, like, that, that, you say... that fucking southern hillbilly twang of hers just complimented that so well, <laughs> let me tell you. It did. And then you've got Nicole Bass behind her, who, I don't want to be detrimental to women, she looked like a man in a crop top. Like, yeah. John Travolta in a blonde wig. That's that's Nicole Bass. John Travolta was probably hotter in drag than, I mean, all respect <laughs> to Nicole Bass. I, I know she just passed away, and I know, you know, it, she yeah. was harassed her entire time in the company. Um, and speaking of time in the company, I think Sable left, like, right after this, like, a month later, like, the lawsuits and shit happened. Yeah, she did. She so, did it, but that, obviously, that with Sable, there was tons of shit going down backstage. At this time in Sable's career, she was just hated backstage. And you could see it on her face. It translated, like, how yeah. she felt about the company. Yeah. It, it, I mean, but I can't blame people backstage. Like, you hear some of the stories of her being a complete bitch to people and... Yeah, the way I understand it, she was the 99, 99 Melina. Like, nobody liked her. She was a comp complete, you know what I'm going to say, Twat. to everybody. It was, I just got her out sooner. Like, she, I don't believe she was drawing that much money that late in 99 for them. She so. wasn't. And you know what? I have said this since I was 15 years, years old because it was so see-through then and what killed Sable's momentum. Come at me, guys. The second, and this is going to sound misogynistic, but this was the attitude error, and everyone thought with their dick as opposed to their head when it came to the women. So hear me out, guys. This, and Matt, you may totally disagree, and that's fine. So the second that Sable posed nude, people stopped giving a shit. The second that Playboy out, it's like her momentum just dwindled every week. Because it's like, you showed us the goods, what do we have to look forward to? That was yeah, maybe the yeah. biggest mistake they did with her character was letting her pose nude. You know what I, mean? I agree, because I think the attraction with Sable was what lies underneath. Um, You're goddamn right. It wasn't with their promo or wrestling skills. It was what do they look yeah. like. Can you imagine somebody tuning in going, I really want to watch this Sable match? No one ever did that. Well, it was all about... No, no that's not true. In 98 and 90... Well, before she posed nude in 98, people were saying that. Look at the pop she got in the mixed tag at WrestleMania 14 when she busted out Sable bombs for the first time. People did want to see Sable. It's just... I think the more when the nude stuff came out, that really hurt. And it also, they didn't like this week on Raw that Alexa Bliss wasn't on it, and that's smart. Cool her off. They overexposed the fuck out of Sable. They really did. They exposed they did, every but, uh, weakness of her on a promo. Every time they put a microphone in their hand, they took a hell of a risk, and you saw how it played out. She had no promo skills. Her 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 voice <laughs> was just so cringy. Jim Cornette's going on this rant. So I don't really, she couldn't dance. She couldn't wrestle. She couldn't do anything. She had big fake tits, and that's what got her <laughs> over. I don't want to be that guy. At least Sonny had fucking charisma. And Sonny was entertaining for a time. You know what I mean? Yep, she was. She was. I should, fine, I should, then I should have said I never tuned in thinking I really want to watch this Sable match. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> yeah. I, I will say uh, this actual match. Um, Tori, for those of you who don't know, Terry uh, Power was brought in as the stalker to Sable, which was ridiculous. Um, yeah. Go ahead, give but everyone a little an backstory to build up. Another fucking storyline they rolled out ten, just under ten years late with Mickey James and Trish Stratus. It was done way better, I thought, with Mickey and, and Trish. Agreed. It's the same premise, though. Like They went full lesbian with the Mickey and Trish stuff. It was great. Yeah, that was much better. <laughs> Listen to us. Right, <laughs> let's move on to the match. Um... <laughs> Nicole Bass won this in 20 seconds, and it was a choke slam. Hands that could crush a television, can I just say, Nicole Bass. Yeah. Like, if even I would have been left with a concussion if she'd have hit me with them hands. They were massive. 
Do you remember the first ECW pay-per-view, Barely Legal? I do. Do you remember in the main event, you know, Tommy Dreamer was commentating and he chokeslammed Big Dick Dudley off the crow's nest through a table? And there was like yeah. a, there was like a miscommunication and it was like a botch. Yeah. You, that chokeslam was better than this chokeslam from Nicole Bass. Agreed. She, she, I mean, the size of Nicole Bass and then how small Tori was, she looked like she... She looked like she was picking up three cinder blocks, Nicole Bass. She could barely get her up. Like, yeah. should you not just be able to pick her up with one hand and slam her? See, that's the thing. They signed Nicole Bass. Um, she got her, her claim to fame, obviously, in the Howard Stern show. And then she was a manager for Just Incredible, speaking of ECW, for about a year and a half. Yeah. Little did they know, she never fucking wrestled in ECW. <laughs> she had no wrestling experience. And I get it's a 20-second fucking match. And, you know, it was a chokeslam spot. The woman couldn't even do a chokeslam. My stepson no. can do a chokeslam and make it look good, <laughs> for fuck's sake. Do you, do you think they brought Bass in? I mean, they brought her in because of her size, clearly. But do you think they brought her in with some intention of going, could be the next China? I totally think that. The problem is, she was no China. Another thing, there was, a big no. there was also a huge talent exchange behind the scenes with WWF and ECW at the time. You know, because they, they yeah. funded ECW for years. There's a lot of that going on with talent raids and say what you want. It was just that time in wrestling, but Jesus oh, Christ. But someone, surely. There must have been someone better than Bass. Take Beulah. Tommy Dreamer's real-life fucking wife. Take her for four months. But, like, you know, to play devil's advocate again, if I'm bringing in Nicole Bass, I'm the booker, that's fine to make her a bodyguard for, like, a sable or, a you know, a super hot you know, little yeah. woman, just have her stand there with her arms crossed. She doesn't need to talk. She doesn't even need to breathe. Just have her fucking yes. stand there. That's all they should have done. She and just, and maybe a punch and knock out somebody here and there, but that's it. She could have been the Mr. Hughes of women. She could have. And then, then, you know what? That may sound like an insult. It might be, but I don't think it is. <laughs> it's not. I love, I, I love Mr. Hughes as a child. Like, not the wrestler. He was... But his character... Kid. Yeah, the character, the bodyguard character, that was good. It was like, he didn't talk. He looked he looked like you wouldn't want to meet him in a dark alley at night, you know? Just go 15 years before this. Go to NWA, Big Bubba Rogers, as the yeah. silent bodyguard. That shit fucking works. And WWF always wants to split hairs and overcomplicate this shit. It's not that hard to book a bodyguard. It's not. It worked. It worked with Kevin Nash when he was a di when he was Diesel for a while. But see, sure you know what? I think in. that's the thing. I think that was the first time we saw a bodyguard come in where like he blossomed onto his own. And I think you know ever since that, they're like, well, goddamn, they could be the next Diesel. And no, Vince, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, they were lucky with Kevin Nash that he was a wrestler. Right. Anyway. I mean, that's being generous, but, calling Nash a wrestler, but let's... Yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, you can say that. His, his WCW run was almost all bad for me, but his time with Diesel, very fun memories as a child. Yep. That was my guy, actually. That was my favorite guy back then. Um, let's move the train along, Matt. Where did that take us next on the show? That took us to Shane versus X-Pac European Championship. And a video package that aired before this, where X-Pac... I don't know how much weed is smoked, but forgets the name of the belt that he's fighting for. Yeah, uh, this was, they literally copied and pasted the same vignette they used at WrestleMania that year. They just updated yeah. the last 20 seconds. I remember this, even when I was a kid, this vignette is, like, Shane's walking out here with the damn, uh, the damn fucking, uh, some belt. Yeah, it was, it was bad. <laughs> can I, can I just say, X, X just a minute. X, can I, go ahead real quick. I'll, I'll say this real quick. X-Pac. When you're booked into a title match with a McMahon at WrestleMania, and it's your turn to cut a promo, you got to want it, man! Yes, and there it is. The money shot. <laughs> All over your faces. All over your faces. <sighs> Grossest episode right. ever, Matt. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love the European Championship, right? I, I really like that, because for the first time, it felt like England were getting, like, the first taste of a title. Because it's the fucking European Championship. The Bulldog won it. Fine. It's from Europe. I never, ever got why, and I still don't to a degree, why put the European Championship on an American? Like, they had more American champions than they did European champions. Like, genuine people from Europe. And that, for me, that's, I know, 
Like people are going to bring up comparisons like Kevin Owens is Canadian, he's the United States champion. That's fine, but th- that title will go back to an American at some point. It's going to go through Nakamura first. It's a heel angle. But it's going to go back. Yeah. It's true, it's a heel angle. But that champion, that US championship, I would say on a whole, is going to be held by more Americans in its time than it is anybody else from around the world. I think that also, that's more of a case of the time, because, I mean, Bulldog wasn't even in for the show. He he would come back later in this year. Yeah. There just, there just wasn't enough UK guys in the company. There, I think that's why, honestly. I mean, besides Bulldog and Regal, I mean, he was there in late 98 for a cup of coffee. He would come back, like, two years <laughs> later. But who else was there that was UK that could really, you know what I'm saying? I, I just I, thought, I, I, I... I agree with that, but just retire the title then. Exactly. Like, re- That's what I was going to say. Just let it go away then. You know what I mean? Fucking. It's like it's like taking the UK Championship and go. It's not on telly enough. We'll give it to Cena. Give it to Cena for eight yeah. months, and then then we'll give it to Styles. Give it to Big Styles Show. Styles can do something with it. Then we'll give it to Big Show. Um, Brock. Brock can get it over, and not one fucking UK bloke in between. Like, keep it for what it's meant to be for. And that I think that's one of the <clears throat> big reasons why the European Championship just it no one cared about it in the it end. It stagnated until it was retired. It did. It did. And Regal was the last I'd say the last I can't fucking find the word. Credible. Regal was the yeah, Regal was the last credible European champion. Because he was actually from fucking Europe. You know what? Say what you want. I loved when D'Lo Brown was the European champion. Because he did kind of a, <laughs> you know, he did kind of a Kevin Owens thing like he's doing right now. You know what I mean? That was the gimmick. Yeah. Like, he would say he was from, like, fucking Helsinki, Finland one week. And it was great. I liked it. But that that that, that, was, that was something. Like, at least he was trying to make it fun, D'Lo Brown. Like, by announcing it from, um, from himself from all these different European places. Yeah. Just yeah. Shane McMahon. And I'm sure if you weren't a thousand miles away from me right now, you would strangle me by saying this. D'Lo Brown was my favorite European champion ever. Stop it. He was. I'm not, it was because of that fucking storyline, man. I really liked it. I really liked oh D'Lo. Oh, my God, Travis. Really? I, really? I mean, because look, when Bulldog had the European belt, of course, he had that phenomenal match with Owen to win the belt, but they didn't do mm-hmm. anything. They put him in a feud with Shamrock where they had to eat dog food like we talked about, and then nothing until Shawn Michaels took it. You know what I mean? That, that, that That's true. And I wasn't even going to say the Bulldog was my favourite European champion. Regal was, <clears throat> for the fact that the title, I'll give D'Lo Brown his, his due fine. He, he made it fun. But then after D'Lo Brown came all the X Park and all the fucking Shane McMahon shit. Yeah, yeah. And for me, that devalued, devalued the title a lot. I just think and maybe then, the reason I'm not saying Regal is because I don't really remember his run with the European belt. It, I, I think I picked D'Lo because it just sticks with me all these years. It really, it does. It was a standout of the Attitude Era was D'Lo's European title run for me. Are, are you telling me, Travis, you've forgotten the, uh, the Duchess of Queensbury rules match? I just remembered it now. <laughs> I did. I'm not going to lie, I did. Because you know what, man? A lot of these, like, I'm a, I'm a trivia buff on, you know, early wrestling. But this time it starts to get a little fuzzy when you get to 2000 and on. A little fuzzy. Um, yeah. That speaks to my age. Uh, <laughs> not getting any younger. Not a spring that, chicken. Can I just say, that's my main gripe with the European Championship. Like, no, it, I totally it was agree. good. It was bad. It was good again. And then you had fucking Midian fighting for it, and then it just lost all the... Didn't he hold the European anything. title? I'm pretty sure Midian had... Yeah, Midian. yeah, he did. I can't remember he beat for it. He might have beaten Regal. Oh, no. Did Regal not lose it to Hardcore Holly? And then Hardcore Holly lose it to Midian? I have no fucking that clue. Is, that's... that's, re- that's <laughs> Hardcore Holly's name is in there somewhere for feuding for the... European Championship. So you're telling me you didn't like it at WrestleMania X7 when Test defended against Eddie Guerrero, the European title. <laughs> you know, funnily, funnily enough, Travis, it's not on one of my top ten matches of all time. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's shocking. I thought it'd be like nine at least, but uh, <laughs> Shane and X Pac, okay. you know, like like you said, they copy and paste the vignette from WrestleMania 15. X Pac stoned as a motherfucker. Yeah. The match, you know, honestly, my fair match of the night. It's why I mean, it was it entertained me the most. I know yours was a six mm. man. Out of all, yeah. Um, I thought they had a way better match at Mania 15, but you know, it's just a case of maybe they phoned it in a little bit more here. But it was, it was okay. Uh, what I mean, they, they they gave them every distraction they could, but <clears throat> another fucking illogical moment. Um, Shane had fired Briscoe and Patterson in the weeks leading up to this. Yeah. So, and 
What did WWE do? Oh, I know. <clears throat> Let's not book a story that makes sense. Let's bring two Americans all the way to fucking England, supposedly not employed by the company anymore, who supposedly had to book their own flights because the company won't because they're, they're not employed <coughs> there, just to stand in the aisle and get twatted by China. Yeah. Does that does that make sense to you? It and doesn't. Patterson, Patterson, not meant to be a WWE employee. What's he fucking come out in? A WWE shirt. And it's cases like that. Our, our good buddy Jay Baca, I'm sure you saw the comments a couple weeks ago on uh, Capital Carnage. You know, it's not yeah. like you and I hate the Attitude Era. I just don't think there was another era in wrestling that had so many fucking plot holes in it. You know, that's my <laughs> main not, problem. I love the Attitude Era. Like, yeah, I liked it too. I, 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 it, it, it saved the business. Let's be real. The Attitude Era saved yeah. wrestling because God knows in 96, the WWF was the shits. You know? Vince would have been out of business by now if it hadn't been for the Attitude Era. Oh, without a doubt. without And like, guys, we love the Attitude Era. It's just like when people wax intellectual on it, we go back, go back and just watch yeah. an episode of Raw from 99. Sometimes content... You know, storyline wise, it's really good, but more times than not, it's not consistent. Look at the fucking Kane origin story, for example. Look how <laughs> much we have gone all over the place with Kane getting set on fire to when he unmasked in 03, not a fucking burn mark. Fucking like, scratch on him, though. And then they tried to say it was like Paul Bear put this mental shit in him, like he really had scars, but it was on the inside. It's like, stop. Just stop. Like, yeah, you, we're not idiots. We're. But Jay, we love you, man. It's just. Ugh, we do. Attitude <clears throat> sometimes it's rough, brother. But, uh... It is. And another crappy ending, another schmarsh, you'd say. Yeah. Where, and uh, basically, Travis, I think you'd agree, a, a carbon copy of the end of the WrestleMania match. Yeah. Yeah, I can't argue with that. Um, yeah, the posse, I think the Main Street Posse wasn't sitting at ringside. That may have been the only difference. And Triple H didn't Well, turn thank heel. fucking God for small mercies. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shout out to Pete Gas, man. He looks good. I just saw a clip on the other day. Uh, I saw him on Grimm's toy show. Yeah, thing yes, where that's he goes where I to the saw Legends him. of the Ring. Yeah, he's looking good, Pete Gas. He, uh, he's looking good, heavier, but good. Yeah, I mean it's twenty years later. So. That's true. Yeah, that was the match. Uh, Shane retains. Anyway, yeah. Bunch of schmoz. Triple H, ped Triple H pedigree. Shane wins. And what do we get after the match? Jerry Lawler. They had no mercy on him. Yep, we've got that by now. Thank you. Yeah, uh, hour and a half into the show, King, we get it. <laughs> fucking. The fucking name of the pay per view is hung above the Titan Tron. Like, we, we know. Yeah, it's not like we, you know, reference the throw in Union Smack at the drop of a hat every chance we get, Lawler. So. Exactly. Um, did that bring us to Billy, Mr. Ass, and Mankind next? No, we got a Michael Cole Mankind interview. And I think, I'm not going to say it. Because I'm actually bored of saying it, but I think everyone can, everyone can guess what Michael Cole said to mankind about what the ministry didn't have for their opponents all night. Was and it I'll leave. patience? <laughs> they had no patience. Oh nope, no! Mercy. Try again. Fuck me! Yay! Fucking no mercy. As if it hadn't been hammered home enough in the hour and a half we'd already had to sit through quite a lot of shit. Um. The head scratching booking doesn't stop here. Uh, Billy Gunn's entrance. I love to love him. I love to leave him. I love to fuck him. I love to pick him. Whatever his theme song was, one of the worst theme musics ever. You think? Do you, do you think? I, I know. <laughs> I don't think. I, right, well then, I feel like a twat now because I love that theme music. For me, that theme music was the best part of Billy Gunn's entire career. Would you, would you, was it more a case of like, it's so bad, it's good for you, like, or you like legit thought it was Yeah, maybe. It, I, I didn't think, I didn't think like, I'll download this or get it on CD uh, at the time and fucking listen to it over and over. It was tongue in cheek. Yeah. You know what I mean? Little laugh. It Bam. was way better it, it, than the, I'm the one Billy Gunn theme a couple years later. Oh Jesus. my God. Jesus that Christ. And, and that, and that fucking theme he had with Chuck Palumbo. Billy and Chuck. Don't you dare hate on Billy and Chuck's theme. <laughs> It was you good. serious? Oh it my was, god! It was good. Um, Not as yeah. good as this. Here, oh. here's here's the head scratching part for me. So Billy Gunn, this was the time where you know they took one of their hottest acts and decided to split up DX for no fucking reason. Uh, this yeah. would lead to a feud with uh, the New Age Outlaws at Over the Edge and a match that nobody cared about. Um, mm -hmm. Billy Gunn, supposed to be a heel now, piece of shit that turned his back on DX, came out, didn't really show any heel mannerisms, and cut a DX promo. He said, <laughs> "Suck it." 
<laughs> and they fucking popped. They popped. Oh my god. Holy shit. This didn't make sense. At least come out and trash the fucking fan. I think he did a little bit, but not really. Like he was still Billy Gunn. Like it just Road Dog was invisible. You would just, you know. I don't know. Yeah. Was it me, Matt? Did he just silk him off like a baby face? <clears throat> it's not you. And that kind of that wasn't the only botch of of that match. Then man, when Mankind came out, I think, I can't remember if it was Jim Ross or Jerry Lawler, they said, oh, Mankind is the only member of the union present here in the UK. Uh, fucking Kane? Hello? Like, Kane, Kane wasn't in the union. It was uh, Test, Big what? Show, Shamrock, and Mankind. Do you know what? I'm sure he was at one point. Maybe if it was just for a week, I'm sure he was there. Wouldn't surprise me. He probably was. I have to go back and look. But yeah, I think the official union, I don't think he was... In it, but maybe uh, maybe he did like teamed up with them in a tag once or something. I don't know. Who knows? Something tells me Kane was there. Like, because I don't really think he was there. because they when they had Kane on early in the show they kept booking the he has trust issues. He doesn't trust anybody. That's why you know he was finally starting to trust X Pac. So I can't really picture them putting him in a stable if they didn't trust anybody. I don't know. I could be completely I'm gonna have wrong. To go back and look at that. I'm gonna have to go back and look at that now because I'm convinced I'm right. Well, you let's leave it really to our, our pallies, our <laughs> listeners. Maybe you guys know. Leave a comment down below after you hit the like button, yeah. of course. Let us know. Was Kane in the fucking union? I mean, are we getting that old? I don't know. <laughs> the match really, it, it was okay. I, it, it was good. It, yeah, it wasn't bad. It wasn't. It wasn't great. It wasn't bad. It, it sat somewhere in the middle of a, a basic raw match. Yeah, could have been a raw. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Mankind slapping himself, like, that didn't do anything for me when he was in the figure four. Just slapping himself, and then, d does it work? Does it hulk him up? No, he fucking passes out again. <laughs> Leave that out of the match. It's it, it, uh, uh, horrible. They did put um, Billy Gunn over strong on Mankind, though. They did. But, can I just say, whoever told Billy Gunn it was a good idea to do that pile driver again, <sighs> needs firing. Like, out the door, bye-bye. <clears throat> um... And how many spots were there on a steel chair in front of the referee and he didn't call a disqualification? Yeah, was it It was Tim White, wasn't it? I think, I think it was Tim White. Tim there was White a pile was... driver on the chair, fucking famous are on the chair, and Tim White standing there going, yep, that's fine, carry Tim, on. Tim White was always one of those refs that like, it was miscommunication. Like, he would look and he wasn't supposed to be. It, I just think Tim White, for some reason, to me, did it more than any other ref. But, like, out of place. You're not supposed yeah. to be there, Tim. Don't get and he, fucked up, he fucked up the ending, Tim White. Did you catch that? I Where did. Where he counted to three too fast. I and did. And Foley didn't have a chance to kick out. Yeah, for a second, I thought Tim White and Billy Gunn were forming a team there because it was a fast <laughs> fucking count. It was a heel count. <laughs> but <laughs> Billy Gunn is your winner, obviously. Billy Gunn would go on to win the King of the Ring and then just irrelevancy for the rest of his career there until Billy and Chuck, I would say, right? Or DX yeah. did reform later this year, but, I mean, Billy Gunn wasn't prominently featured in that a lot. No, he, he wasn't. It took it took um a few more years for him to really be thrust into the light again. And then you know the one Billy Gunn was just never going to work. No, and he had that horrible team with Big Show. What was it? Was it Gun Show? Gun Show. Gun Show. Yes. You know what? Oh, always, Nobody bought think... any tickets to that Gun Show. <laughs> Trust me. Um, I always thought forever. I thought it wouldn't it be better a Shogun like Shogun? Yeah. I'd... I mean, it made they're... sense. That's why they didn't do it, Matt, because it made too much fucking sense to call it that. They always, it's like Breezango. Why not just call him for Breeze? I, 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 exactly, I get that yeah, because right, of, maybe they yeah. probably can't, but that's what you should fucking call him. <laughs> you should call him that. Like, it makes no sense. Like, you've got two really good names. Put them together really well. Or, you know, call just... me crazy. How about you just not make Billy Gunn and Big Show a team in the first place? God. But what what else are they going to do with them? Seriously, like, do you remember that horrible, horrible moment in Big Show's career where he came out dressed as Hulk Hogan at Backlash oh, 2000? Come on, and... man. I love it's one of my favorite Big Show moments against Kurt Angle. I love that yes. fucking moment. Oh, it was like they had no idea what to do with him at all. Like, not 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 one. And so I know. Let's um. <laughs> You know, That's give Big Show credit that really he gone. sounded almost as much like Hulk Hogan as I do. So shout out to Big Show. Is that not? Yeah, but surely being a heavy smoker helped. <laughs> <laughs> You're not telling me if Big Show wasn't on 40 a day, he'd have sound, still sounded like Hulk Hogan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But uh, we have come a long way since the showster. Um, 
<laughs> the show stuff. Now, I, I forgot he like, was even called that. I feel like in five episodes, I, this is maybe the saltiest I've ever been. But I got to pass the buck on this one because I believe it's somebody else's turn to get a little pissed <laughs> off because it's main event time, Matt. The maniac is about to be unleashed full force, I think. Yeah, and can we be honest with our audience, Travis? You're only skipping this because you didn't watch it. I, I actually, I would have watched it. I just didn't get a chance to. So come at me, guys. Go. First time and ever in five episodes, I didn't finish a show. So. <laughs> and he's the luckiest one amongst all I'm, of us. Who yeah, I'm the luckiest shit. man on earth, apparently, according to Matt. So Matt, tell us all what I missed and how lucky I am. Do you want to know what you missed, Travis? You missed nothing. Not a thing. This was meant to be, I'd say by the names in it, Vince hoped this was going to be like the biggest main event he'd ever booked overseas anywhere. And I can say that. You've got Triple H, who in 1999 was coming into his prime. You've got Austin, who was just, I don't don't believe there's been anyone hotter since Austin. You can say Cena, but I don't think he's been as big a draw as Austin was. You could say and Rock, then maybe, but not. I think Austin takes the cake still at the end of the day. I think Austin takes... I mean, The Rock was a big draw. I don't think he was as big as Austin. For, for what Austin did, that sort of carried him through to the end of his career. And it's different eras, and a lot of people always, you know, 80s Hogan or 90s Austin. I would still say 90s Austin because I think even, you know, Hogan in the 80s, of course, he took it mainstream, but across the boards, like, there were still a lot of people booing Hogan in the glory days. It seemed like yeah. it was so rare to find anybody to find booing Austin on one of these shows, if you go back and look. It was just like a case of he was just over with fucking everyone, you know? And I don't think I've ever talked to anyone since the Attitude Era who's ha- hated Austin. Like, not even when he turned on The Rock at WrestleMania 17, people still loved him. Yeah. I mean, who wants to boo your fucking hero? You know what I mean? Exactly. Exactly. And then we had The Undertaker, who... It was a bad idea to book The Undertaker in this match. Like, if people don't know, 1999 wasn't a good time for The Undertaker. He was injured. He was carrying several injuries. Uh, I believe there was one to his hip. There was one to his knee. And I, he was still suffering from that leg drop at SummerSlam the year before. Where yeah. he went, do you remember that? Like, yeah, when he jumped off to Austin through the table. Yeah. That, that um, I don't know the, the name of the bow. But he uh, he sprained that badly. His tailbone? If he broke something. Was it his tailbone? I don't know. It might have been his tailbone. It might have been his tailbone. But I, I know he also he also did something bad to his ankle. I mean, he which was, also, by this time in 99, Taylor had been going strong for nine years with no break. He would get it soon. We yeah. had this, uh, <clears throat> after this, he would form a tag team at the Big Show and win the titles. And then he took months off and came back as a badass. So it's like he never got a vacation. He so he was so beaten up by this time. But he, I'm, 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 people aren't bothered about like a wrestler's personal life, but right. he was going through a divorce as well at this time, so it just wasn't a good era for him. Like he, he was beaten, he was tired. Just wasn't wanted, in a good place mentally. He needed to recharge his batteries. Yeah, and it, that's the way he looked here. Like he, you didn't need to book him on this show. You could have left him in America, let him have a weekend off. Yeah, I mean. But, I don't know. I mean, you you would have had to kind of have him on the show because of the ministry, but he didn't have to wrestle. I agree. You know. Yeah, he he, he limped to the ring. Like, I've never seen him, even as the Dead Man in '92 and '93 when he walked to the ring. I've never seen the Undertaker approach the ring as slow as he did here. Like he, every step, he looked like he was in pain. He was limping. And it's a good job that uh, Austin and Triple H they started this match. Like up the aisle, Triple H attacked Austin as yep. he was making his entrance. Leave the Undertaker in the ring, let it come to him. Like, because it's the first man, it's a no DQ match. First man to get a pinfall or a disqualification, uh, pinfall disqualification. First man to get a pinfall or submission wins. So, does it not make sense to leave Undertaker in the ring? And I let him pick the bones of whoever's left. In any like, other scenario, I would totally agree with that statement. The problem is they booked this match like it was two against one, the whole show. And I think it was did, just a case but, of vultures, you know, going swooping and beating at the ship. But at the end of the day, it's for the fucking title. <laughs> it is. But, I mean, seeing the pain he was in getting to the ring, Travis, the Undertaker, <clears> they then make him get back out and walk back up the aisle. Yeah. Just to, what he basically did was limp around. 
through the weakest belt shot I've ever seen, which went a mile over Austin's head. Oh, God. I can only imagine it. That was horrible. And then they made him limp back to the ring. So he's, he's taken three trips there and back in a matter of seven minutes. And th- that was him done. Like, he could barely do anything else for the whole match. It, it was sad to see. And I just preferred him not to be in this match, if that was if that was the case. If he wasn't ready to go, don't book him. You could just have him come down have... and interfere or something, you know? Exactly. Like, it, it, this was atrocious. And I will go out there and say, people would probably disagree with me. If you've got fond memories of this, you'll disagree with me. This was atrocious, considering the talent that was in the ring that didn't come out on the night. Now, like, was it a case it like horrible. when Triple H and Austin touched in the ring, they just didn't were on the same page also in this match? Or you just think it was a case of shoehorning an injured Taken in there just ruined the match? Oh, no. I mean, Austin and Taker together, uh, Austin and Triple H together, you you wouldn't have known they were wrestlers or ever worked together before. Christ. It was It was... Austin looked blown up maybe six minutes into this. You know, when, before the match got to the ring, like they fought around the uh, the Oval Tron and, and everything else. Before it got to the ring, Austin was, he was blown up. Triple H was the only one that didn't blow up before the end of the match. And it was like every time they touched each other, they botched, they botched um, whips into the ropes. They botched chair shots on the outside. Austin slipped over. On the outside, on the ring mat that he's walked on a thousand times before, just slips over while he's trying to pick Triple H up. It was horrendous. God. Like, I'm, I'm having flashbacks is... of SummerSlam 99 when Austin got caught in the ropes. Triple H had to help him out. Do you remember that? <laughs> yeah, I remember that. It's kind of like that. This huh? is this is the first match featuring Austin, Triple H, or Undertaker that I'd ever say was just don't watch it. Go out your way. If you want to see how bad a match can be how bad like three really talented men can fuck a match right up watch it my dog's in the but background it... whining you just this match sounds so bad <laughs> um, <laughs> it was on, that match. you know it's so surprising because like you said on paper i don't see how this could have been a bad match but jesus christ i don't have to go back and check it out to see how bad it was now in your taker book you know a lot of people say the hell in the cell 98 match with mick foley that took years off mick foley's career a lot of people don't know didn't taker yeah. suffer like a broken foot in that match and like some injuries too he did and I'm not going to go into it too much, because you can read it in my book, Shameless Whore Plug. But Mick Foley almost died in that match, legitimately. The the choke slam through the top of the hell in the cell wasn't meant to happen. The cage wasn't meant to give way. It was meant to give way a little, and then the Undertaker was meant to just kick him through the top of it, so Foley could hang on until he was at least halfway down. But it just gave way. I've heard that and, for years, like, it wasn't meant to go through. But if you go back and look at that choke slam spot, I don't know how you can't see that that was playing to go through. Like, the way he took it, it's he got no yeah. air on it at all. You know what I mean? I know. I, I don't know. know. It's 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 fuzzy if he was meant to or not. I mean, obviously, if you go back and watch, it looks like he was meant to. But who knows? That's true. Who knows? But Only two people knew yeah. what was meant to happen that night. That's, that, yeah, that's true. Only two people. But I have heard, like, whoever secures like the head and the sail together, didn't lo- uh, loosen the, the the flap too much. Yeah. Oh. But, uh, you Which know, I can see happening. This is- let's, let's pull our best Dean Douglas impersonation, get our little grade books out. It is time to grade the very first No Mercy pay-per-view. Matt, across the boards, the whole show, what is your final grade on No Mercy 99, number one? I'm going to go D- minus again. And I don't want to go D- minus again because I've, I've said D- minus for, I think it was Capital Carnage. But this was, again, another bad event. Like, six-man tag, fine. To an extent, Mankind Billy Gunn was fine. Shane McMahon versus X-Pac didn't do anything for me. So really, two matches on the whole card for me carried it, and it's not enough. So I'm going to go D-minus. I am going to do first. Oh, go ahead, Matt. Go ahead. I was just going to, and because of the uh, the main event, which just disappointed on all on all points. I am going to do a first here on uh, Union Smack. Even though I didn't see the main event, the way you describe it, I don't need to. I'm giving this so- show a solid F. And I'll tell you oh, why. Wow. A solid fucking F. Because this is the, you know, uh, arguably the hottest time in wrestling. Not one thing on this show for me was appealing. You know, I had to literally fight the urge to skip 
ahead in every match, Matt, and that's not good. I had the urge to skip through promos from Mick Foley, and when the fuck does Mick Foley cut a bad promo? The booking yeah. of Billy Gunn. The asinine fucking plugging the word no mercy every fucking 30 seconds. <laughs> Too much corporate ministry. It was a shitty stable to begin with, but jeez, yeah. this show, Great. one of the worst Attitude Era shows I've ever seen. Bar none. Ooh. And there you go, like... I thought I was being generous, giving it a D minus, but you're being like Mother Teresa with your generosity because this show deserves an F. It, it, like, real and like the, you know the, the two matches for us, they were only passable at best. The matches yeah. we liked, you know what I mean? What does that say? They were, <laughs> and I, I would challenge anyone who holds the Attitude Era like up there on a a, a huge plateau to to watch this. And not be bored in the first 25 minutes. Even simplistic things. Getting the brood... Yeah, we didn't even mention the brood got their heat back. They came out and gave somebody a bloodbath, I'm guessing, right? No, 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 not a bloodbath. Um, really quick run through. Austin wins with a stunner on Triple H. Because fucking Undertaker couldn't take the move. And, yeah, corporate ministry come down. Attack Austin. Brood slash union come down. Save Austin. End of show. Yeah, it's just, God, the women's title was in the dumpster in this time. You open your show with Tiger Ali singing Gilbert, who's not even a light heavyweight. That makes no sense to begin with. It's just, God damn it, who had the book? This this was, and the scary thing is, yes, everyone, the whole world shits on Vince Russo, but I'm one of those guys who goes to bat for Russo because he didn't always give us crap. But if Vince Russo wrote this show, holy shit. Yeah. Vince Russo did a lot of damage to wrestling in his career, but I'd like to think he had more brains than to book this. I mean, if he didn't, fair enough. Like, he deserves all the shit he gets. Yeah. Everything Cornette said to him, as far as I know, is true. <clears throat> I know me and Logan will get into that at some point. And our new Future of Wrestling podcast, shameless whore plug, sorry. With a, but with yeah, a pretty new logo, by the way, I saw. Pretty new logo. By, <laughs> yeah, created by... By some guy. One only Travis here. <laughs> oh, I, ju I just think, man... That... <sighs> This show doesn't seem like it was written by Russo because this show just would seem out of place in like a typical Raw back then. So this seemed like they went to the UK. Vince was like, oh, I'll do it. You know what I mean? I'll take the book or something like that. I don't think – I really don't think Russo wrote this show. I don't. I think, to be honest, looking down the card, I mean, I'd, I'd never go back and rewatch this unless it was a fucking gun to my head. Like, <laughs> you, you wouldn't get me watching this crap again. I'm surprised it had a writer. Like, it completely looked thrown together from beginning to end. Yeah, this was booked just like a Nitro at the time, where just a bunch of matches for no reason and horrible backstage vignettes and, and, and the heel faction coming out way too many times, like the NWO used to, the scream like a Nitro, you know? Yeah, it, it, it did. And I refuse to believe anybody can, can write that badly. <laughs> but oh, then it's I'll possible. Say that, and this, this is WWE. It's happened since. Who, who can forget the, uh, the crappy 2004 period of SmackDown? Like, Ugh. I mean, you could go before this and go to Herb Abrams' UWF if you want to see bad book. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever <laughs> caught any of those shows. Holy shit. But you said the word, or I said the word Nitro, and what a beautiful segue. Next week, Matt, we have a guest. Would you like to know? I would like to know. This Next week, we're going day. out of the realm of the UK. We're going to review the very first WCW Nitro episode. And pleased to welcome for the first time Broski from First Thing in the Morning, our special <laughs> guest next week, Matt. It's going to be tremendous. Can't wait. It is. It's. I've never met him, but can't wait to. He, get him he on. put me on the spot on his show yesterday. He's on air. He's asked if he could come on. I'm like, I can't say no. So. <laughs> <laughs> but there you guys. Make sure you tune in next week. With Broski for the first night to review, um, Matt, as always, my friend, beyond a pleasure to do this with you. Absolutely. And I love it. <laughs> you can probably tell that. And again, thank you to everyone who has picked this up and loved it. Exactly. And one more time, before we get out of here, real quick, where can everyone check you out on Twitter once again, what you do, and your new show you can plug out? I can. You can check me out on Twitter at TenantFutureDW. Look out for my book coming soon a trip down death valley the history of the undertaker and you can catch myself and logan on our new podcast the future of wrestling coming very soon i wish i would have met you months earlier so i could have wrote the forward for your book because i've never been in a book <laughs> <laughs> my friend i've got so much more writing to do you can write the foreword if you want yes. 
That's what I'm I talking about. Want this. I do not want to sit down and rock it yet. <laughs> Gotta want it, man. Real quick, follow me on Twitter at the Ibiki TMD. Check out the reset button, Slam Picks Podcast, Slam Picks Cruise Control, and this Union Smack. Until next week, we will see you guys right here. Cheerio, mates. Cheerio, mates. Hey, you dirty fucking pigs. Mike here from the Slam Pigs Podcast, reminding you once again to check us out on Twitter, whether it be the Slam Pigs Podcast, whether it be me at Mike the Slam Pig, or whether it be our sister show, The Reset Button. Check us out. Also, you can find us on Facebook at the Slam Pigs Podcast or The Reset Button. And as always, make sure you check us out as a whole on Hibiki TMD. Until we see you next time, oink oink.